guys here, welcome. Thank you so much for clicking. I'm going to explain how me, a current non-Muslim, understands Islam. For the last three years, I've been on a journey to explore and understand Islam. I studied Islamic studies for one term at university. I lived in the Muslim country of Malaysia, and I've questioned many of my Muslim friends about Islam. And I do want to say that this journey over the last two years has made me realize how misinformed and kind of uneducated non-Muslims in the West are about Islam. They can be quite judgmental, but Islam is a very beautiful religion, so let's understand why. As we all know, there is the Quran. The Quran is really like the guidance for Muslims. You can go to the Quran, you can read parts of the Quran if you're ever having a problem. How does the Quran advise you to address this problem? This is really the holy book and the fundamentals of Islam. Muslims also can refer to the Hadith. The Hadith is really, in simple words, the teaching and words from the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad, he was sent here by Allah, the God, to really help Muslims on earth, guide them on how to do things correctly in accordance with wow. Islam. So Muslims really look at both books and both books are really seen as very vital when understanding Islam. One of the first things I ever learned about Islam is to preserve life at all costs. Now I thought this was such a beautiful thing, it's stuck in my head since day one learning about Islamic studies. Since going into my Islamic studies class where my Islamic teacher was like, Anna, what are you doing here? As one of a minority of non-Muslims at my university, she was quite confused as well as in the class. But I just wanted to learn. And I remember one of her first things she ever taught me about Islam was reserve life at all costs. And that fundamentally does mean that if you have to bend some of the guidance from the Quran in order to preserve your life or others, then you can do so. Islam is built on five pillars as my understanding. First of all, we have the Shahada. The Shahada is your profession of faith. And this goes by saying there is no God but God and Muhammad the messenger of God. So you're really saying that there's only one God, Allah, and also his messenger that came to spread the word of Islam here on earth. Islam in general is really such a beautiful religion because it's just all about being such a good person. It's not like a cult or something like this. It's about being such a good person. And I'm going to get on to this in just a second. The second pillar of Islam is the Salat. And these are the five Muslim prayers that you will do throughout the day. And you will pray to God. And it's actually quite important to do these five prayers in Islam. As long as your intention is good, your intention is clear, that is honestly what matters so much. If you can't do everything that the Quran expects or wants of you, if your intention is clear but you just can't quite get to it today, it's okay, I think. The third pillar of Islam is zakat. Zakat is donating to charity. Usually every year, a percentage of your wealth, you should try and donate to charity. Again, what a beautiful idea. We should all be doing this anyway. The fourth pillar of Islam is Som, which is your fasting during Ramadan. During the holy month of Ramadan, you need to try and refrain from eating and drinking during the sunlight hours, but it goes more than that. Ramadan is really about cleansing your mind. Try not to go Gossip. Try not to swear. Definitely not drinking alcohol, which you shouldn't be doing in Islam anyway. But it's also about doing good deeds, giving to charity. Every good deed that a Muslim will do during Ramadan is actually doubled in the good deeds. Not even doubled, it's like times 70. It's really a lot. So during Ramadan, the holy month, you should try and give and do as many good things as you can and just forget about the bad we as humans sin every day, but God forgives us for this. During Ramadan, we really take that extra effort to try and not do these bad things. The fifth pillar of Islam is Hajj. Hajj is your pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca, and you will go there and do all the holy things that the Prophet once did. You kind of follow in his footsteps around doing what he did before. What I will say here is you only do this if you can afford to do it because it is a little bit expensive and if you're actually healthy enough to do so. All right, moving on to haram and halal. We all know these terms, even if you're non-Muslim, we've known this for a long time. Haram, halal. So haram is something that is forbidden in Islam. Now, I wanted to get onto this as soon as possible because I know in the West, non-Muslims are like, oh, how can something be forbidden? Like, that is just so restrictive. It's not like this. Things that are haram are haram for a reason. There is always a reason behind something that you should or shouldn't do in Islam. 
Islam. For example, as we all know, Muslims are forbidden to drink alcohol. Alcohol is haram. As I believe before, people were actually, this might be wrong, but this is what I have read and discussed with some of my Muslim students. Back before, you actually were allowed to drink one glass of wine. However, there was two problems here. First of all, the size of the glass. Everyone's glass was different. It meant that everyone was consuming different amounts of alcohol. Number two, this led to some people getting drunk off maybe even one glass. It was forbidden. And why fundamentally was alcohol forbidden in Islam? Because as we know, if you do drink alcohol, or as you are aware, if you don't drink alcohol, alcohol makes you drunk. What happens when you're drunk? Sometimes your vision is blurred. You certainly can't remember what you're doing. You're unaware of your actions and how they are affecting others. You can definitely sin and do bad things. Another example, pork. Pork is forbidden because of the enzymes that can be bad for our health. The pig is seen as a dirty animal because the pig eats anything. It eats trash, it eats plastic, it eats honestly anything. And that is why, again, it is forbidden in Islam. Everything that is haram has a reason. Moving on to halal. Halal things. What, are, what does halal Meat. Halal is something that is okay in Islam. So, for example, halal meat is slaughtered in a very specific way that is in accordance with the Sharia law. It means that the prayer has been done on the animal and the animal was not made to suffer during the slaughter, which is obviously very beneficial for the animal because we do eat meat and we don't want the animals to suffer when we do slaughter them. Now, moving on to a topic that is definitely misunderstood in Islam for non-Muslims in the West specifically is women in Islam. And today I actually was reading this book about the status of women in Islam. Now this is a very lovely book. I do suggest you go and read it. It's by Dr. Jamal A. Badawi. As I have grown with Islam and learned about Islam over the last three years, I've definitely understood something here. Now, non-Muslims specifically in the West do look at Islam as this is oppressive, restrictive. Now, I want to put a clause here because there are some countries that have become extreme. Now, that moves away from the fundamentals of Islam and becomes extreme. If we stick in the realm of good Islamic practice, if we look at a country like Malaysia. The fundamentals of women in Islam is really to protect the woman. The woman is seen as this precious, beautiful flower and those guidance is in place to make sure that she has a beautiful life. She plays to her strength. In Islam, men and women are physically, psychologically different. And I know people in the West want to think like men and women are exactly biologically the same, but biologically we're not the same. We are more emotional as women and that's why guidance is put in place in Islam to ensure that women are always protected. This book is very interesting because it is saying that prehistorically in Christian times, in Catholic times, women were not equal like men. Women were seen as down here. But all this period of time when in the West women are starting to get more rights, which is fantastic, I'm all for that. But in Islam, the rights have always been there. Women have always had the right to own their property, lease out their property. In Islam, the woman's money is for her. It is the man's responsibility to even ensure the wife is cared for, the children are cared for, the family is cared for. That responsibility is passed to the man to ensure the woman can do her womanly things that come naturally to her, child rearing, having children, taking care of the family. I'm not saying that this is exactly correct, but I'm saying this is what the fundamentals of Islam is, that the woman plays to her strength, which is the emotional bond with children, raising the family. The man goes out, he provides, takes care of the family and doesn't give that stress to the woman. That is honestly the fundamentals that I understand from Islam. And to me, I do think that's very beautiful. And if you are a woman who wants to have a family, if you marry into a Muslim family, if your partner is Muslim, he is going to want to take care of you so that you can take care of the children, if that's what you want. This book explains that Islam has never stopped women from having a job. It has been the case where if she needs to get a job, she can get one. But if she doesn't need to, she can choose not to have a job. That's what I understand. And I know sometimes that 
again, people in the West might jump to conclusions with things about inheritance because there are very interesting laws when it comes to inheritance when there is a daughter and a son. I don't know specifically, I would have to go and research more, but I know that oftentimes the male will get more money than the female. And of course, we jump to conclusions and think this is so wrong, like that's ridiculous. But again, as I've explained, if the female is marrying into a Muslim household, the man is Muslim, he will be providing for her any money she earns, she keeps for herself. But the son will then have to provide for the wife and the children. So that's why he gets more. Again, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, this is just what I understand. And just on the topic of women in Islam, I just want to read one very interesting passage from this book that said, Prophet Muhammad said, the most perfect believers are the best in conduct and the best of you are those who are best to their wives. Yeah. It means that in Islam, they've always wanted the best yeah. for women. You treat women so yeah. well. Again, in Islam, your mother is so important. Paradise is beneath your mother's foot in Islam. There's another beautiful thing that Prophet Muhammad said when someone asked Prophet Muhammad, like, he said, a man came to Prophet Muhammad asking, messenger of God, who among the people is the most worthy of my good company? The Prophet said, your mother. The man said, who else? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, then who else? Only then did Prophet Muhammad say, your father. So like the women are just so important in Islam is what I understand. And above all else, guys, in the Quran, it says, Always ask questions. Muslims, men and women, doesn't matter, have always been told that it's okay to ask questions. They can even ask questions about their religion. They can go to a man and ask him, why, why do we do this? And he will give a valid response. It's more than okay to ask questions in Islam. And that, being able to be free to ask those questions means that Islam is not worried about saying the wrong answer. They know the answer will be correct. They know how to teach how to be a good human being. If you like this video, I know you're gonna love this video where I ask my Muslim friend, more questions that non-Muslims like me are really confused about. So, that was a very beautiful one, guys. Woo! She actually summarized everything you need to know about Islam. And as a non-Muslim, you can easily grab this. On the 11 minutes, she gave us beautiful and straightforward answer regarding Islam. She first started with the Quran that their, their spiritual book is Quran, spoke about the Hadith. Hadith was written by Prophet Muhammad for the Muslims. And she spoke about the five pillars, the Shahada, the charity, the, you know, um, Ramadan period, the going to the Hajj, you know. It's something that you can actually grab, even though you've never even heard about Islam, or you've never come about a Muslim or you don't have any Muslim friend or you've never watched any Islam videos if you watch this video you get full understanding of everything and the fact that she also said women are respected in Islam so that one people always say there's oppression violence is not true they don't oppress their women or their wives it's your choice to work as a woman as a wife and is the responsibility of a man to cater for his wife and the children the money she makes is for herself only if only she wants to assist her husband but majorly is men that take over the, the full responsibility of the home in islam and she was like that was a beautiful one mothers are really respected in islam that they don't joke with their mothers even prophet Muhammad said you should care for your mothers care for your mother before you even measured your father. So women are very respected in Islam. And I just love the fact that, you know, she said she has been learning this for like two years. And this is all we need to know. As a beginner, new convert, or you, if you're planning to convert, all this information is something that will give you a guideline to the religion more. It will help you understand what the religion is all about. So that by the time you accept Islam, you don't have to do too much to learn because you already know the important things. You just like saying that the basis of life. So these are the basis when it comes to Islam. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I love her vibe. I love the way she was talking, explaining everything, letting us understand like, whoo. Even though most of the explanation she gave, I, I'm already aware. So I know about the five pillars. I know about the Hadith and the Quran. The only one that I was really impressed about when she spoke about the mother and women are being respected because of what the society always have in mind that 
women are being oppressed or they are no no they are never oppressed they don't oppress their women they treat them like an heck they pamper them so well and that was a beautiful one guys let me know your thoughts guys let's keep this discussion going guys thank you so much for watching don't forget to smash that subscribe button for more beside it you'll see the notification bell turn it on so that whenever i upload you'll be the first person to be notified like share and comment i'll see you guys in the next one Bye.